И вот что мы, как те, которые принимают участие в общении с такими людьми, можем как-то справляться с этим? Я разделила мое выступление на две части, то есть во второй, в первой части я более теоретически хочу рассказать об этих проблемах, а во второй части буду давать примеры, как с ними справляться. И, наконец, хочу показать вам одну часть моих научных результатов, исследования, которые я вела на одной группе людей с проблемами, и они, как результаты моих исследований, они в какой-то степени оправдывают все то, о чем я буду говорить раньше. Но э, хотела бы э, начать с того, чтобы сказать несколько слов о себе, и вот эта часть, э, которую буду вести на русском, а потом переключусь на английский язык. Ну, причина переключения на английский очень несложная, то есть я до сих пор никогда не выступала э, с такими темами на русском языке, и хотя знаю русский язык, мне просто немножко сложновато подбирать э, специализированную лексику, то есть э, подумала, что на этот раз, если есть возможность вести занятия на английском, так мне будет легче. Э, но вступительная часть несложная, то есть, то есть расскажу на русском. То есть, как видно на презентации, я работаю в двух местах. То есть, прежде всего, я учитель в Варшавском университете, и там веду занятия на русском языке и на английском. И, конечно, это научная часть моей деятельности. То есть, работа в университете, она помогла мне приобрести теоретические знания на, насчет того, как вести занятия, как обучать студентов и детей иностранным языкам. То есть, как бы, теоретический опыт и все теоретические знания – это благодаря занятиям в университете. Но, конечно, как мы все знаем, люди, с которыми мы встречаемся в университете, это прежде всего взрослые, то есть, ну, прежде всего, это просто взрослые люди, студенты. Но э, во время разного типа занятий я замечаю, что есть разные группы этих студентов. То есть есть такие, которые, у которых нет никаких коммуникационных проблем, но есть и такие, э, для которых контакт с преподавателем является своего рода проблемой. И вот во время такого контакта они ведут себя время от времени странновато, или нам, как преподавателям, может казаться, что данное поведение студента странноватое. Но если мы знаем возможные причины такого поведения, тогда наш способ восприятия его может поменяться так, чтобы мы даже сможем помочь такому студенту. Но об этом будем рассказывать дальше. Ну, как бы, я бы даже сказала, главной частью моего опыта является работа в школе, так как я параллельно преподаватель английского языка в одном из варшавских общеобразовательных лицеев. Это небольшая школа, но благодаря работе в этой школе, а она, эта работа длится уже, господи, 16-17 лет, я приобрела опыт, связан с разного типа контактами, отношениями с молодыми людьми. То есть студенты общеобразовательного лицея в Польше – это молодежь, они обычно, им обычно с 16 по 20 лет. То есть они практически уже взрослые, но еще можно бы причислить их к группе детей. И во время работы, во время занятий по английскому я заметила, что у школьников появляются разного типа проблемы. Некоторые из них связаны с проблемами с сообщением, но другие проблемы связаны с, со способом работы во время занятий. И как бы подытоживая это, я могу сказать, что опыт работы в университете и опыт работы в лицее он позволил мне прийти к разным наблюдениям и позволил мне поставить разные вопросы. И давайте посмотрим, вот, что я заметила. Вот здесь ничего неожиданного нет. То есть на основании этих контактов с молодыми людьми я убедилась в том, что люди равные. Это, это тоже ничего, не что новое. Но я уверена, что есть разные группы, которых 
выступ, у которых выступают разные проблемы с сообщением. И в зависимости от того, какая это группа, эти проблемы являются разными. И, конечно, хотя мы говорим сейчас о молодых людях, то есть о студентах, о школьниках, мы должны помнить, что они через несколько лет станут людьми взрослыми и будут принимать активное участие в общественной жизни и просто будут вынуждены общаться в разных ситуациях. И мы, как люди, которые ведут занятия, которые работают, которые как-то должны организовать профессиональную деятельность таким людям, мы в состоянии организовать нашу работу, вот наши отношения с ними таким образом, чтобы облегчать их жизнь и нашу жизнь. И об этом мы будем сегодня говорить. То, что меня удивило, это прежде всего во время работы в школе, это то, что и у меня время от времени появляются разного типа проблемы. Это меня удивило, потому что ну, теоретически у меня никаких дефицитов нет, по крайней мере, я просто не знаю о таких, но есть э, ситуации, в которых и мне сложновато. Примером такой ситуации может стать работа с учебником, то есть во время занятий на английском мы, конечно, пользуемся учебниками, которые подготовлены для такой работы, то есть это э, учебники по английскому языку, и вот они очень привлекательные в таком графическом смысле. И оказывается, что разобраться, где в таком учебнике на картинке что находится, вызывает проблемы даже для меня. Хотя у меня, как у учителя, есть время заранее подготовиться к этому. И это стало моментом, когда я начала ставить вопросы, почему это так, почему даже у меня, если у меня есть время заранее, все-таки контакт с материалами, иногда вызывает проблемы. И заметила, что если у меня человека без дефицитов такие проблемы есть, наверное, они есть и у других, то есть у тех групп учеников, школьников, у которых просто есть разного типа дефицит. И сейчас я переключусь на английский язык, так как начинаем вот эту более сложную для меня тему. Так, то есть еще только сделаю одну вещь, так чтобы организовать э, немножко по-другому. Так, я... Yeah. Uh, let's start with, uh, with defining the, the problems that may occur in case of the students. So today I would like to describe the idea, well, that is not the idea, that is just something that was um, well checked and well researched, uh, that the thing that, that are called developmental disorders, uh, because um, the problems of school students and adults that I want to talk about today are just developmental disorders. So according to, to literature, according to data that you can find in many scientific books, developmental disorders are a group of conditions caused by an impairment in physical learning, language or behavior areas. And these conditions, they begin during the developmental period. So quite early, young kids or just small school students, if they are to have developmental disorders, that is the moment that the disorders should be somehow noticed. And these disorders, they may impact day-to-day -day functioning. And what is the most important, they can last through a person's lifetime. So they cannot be cured. The people have to somehow learn how to live with their problems. Of course, the effects of almost all developmental disorders can be reduced if they are early and aggressively treated. So, as I said, you can help the people, but you cannot cure them. You cannot make the, the developmental disorders disappear. Some scientists say that it would be even better to call developmental disorders, neurodevelopmental disorders, because they are related to neurodevelopmental develop, neuro, neurological development of the people. And the neurodevelopmental disorders are neurologically based conditions, and they can interfere with the acquisition, 
with retention, application of specific skills or sets of information. And they may involve different uh, dysfunctions. For example, dysfunctions in attention, in memory, in perception, in language acquisition, uh, in problem solving and social interactions. And what is important when talking about them is that some of them can be mild and easily manageable, but some of them can be of more severe type and then they become more problematic. And in case of kids, of children who, are, who suffer from more severe developmental disorders, um, it is more complicated to help them and such children may require more support. So let's have a look at types of developmental disorders. There are some of them, but probably the ones that you are somehow familiar with are uh, free out of the group which is listed on, on the slide. So probably the most popular, let's call them like that, are attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. That is also autism spectrum disorder. And from my point of view, this one is quite interesting and I would like to tell quite a few words about this one. Then learning disabilities such as dyslexia and different parts, different kinds of impairments on, in other academic areas and different types of intellectual disabilities. Of course, there are more of them, but these are the most often and probably the most common. And today I would like to concentrate on the first one, so ADHD, and then we will talk about some very specific type of autism spectrum disorder, which is Asperger syndrome, and we will concentrate a bit on dyslexia because these three things may occur and they just surround us quite often. Well, the things that I mentioned are called developmental disorders, but when the person, the, the, the kid goes to school, another category occurs. Well, the category is special educational needs. That is something that is related to the developmental disorders and the consequences of them that can be seen in the process of education. Because if the person is, if the person suffers from the problems of that type, uh, it must have some consequences on the process of learning and teaching the person. And according to some research, it turned out that, for example, in 1990s, there were 20% of school students who couldn't adapt to curricula and to school requirements. So 20% is, quite, is quite a big group of students. And it turned out to be quite a serious problem. It also turned out that these 20% of school students that that was the research done in Great Britain. They were the kids with special educational needs. If you analyze the topic further, it will quickly turn out that in a group of 30 school students, on average, of course, 22 are typical. So that means that they have no special problems at all. So they can perceive information by different senses. And it doesn't make any difference if the, the information is given in oral way, in written way. Just not a problem to perceive information in any, uh, in any way. In the group of 30 students, there are two or three who have learning problems which are related to outside, so not, not school factors. For example, they may have some family problems like divorce in a family, like problems with alcohol, whatever related to their parents. So these are the problems that school cannot really control. <clears throat> but in such a big group, on average, there are six kids who perceive information only by dominant channel. So they prefer only visual or only verbal, or sometimes they are kinesthetic, so prefer kinesthetic way of, of uh, giving information. That means that such a big group, so six out of 30 school students, 
they need special treatment and special way of teaching. And of course, they need the teacher who would understand their problems. And these six students in a group of 30, in some time, they will become adult people and their problems will not disappear. But the society should somehow learn how to cope with their problems as well as them. They should know what to do, how to function as not to uh, suffer from these problems anymore. Of course, it may happen that at the level of school, uh, the special educational needs are not respected. And unfortunately, it happens uh, quite often, fortunately, less and less often if we compare that with the time um, in the past. If their special educational needs are not respected, <clears throat> It may cause many unnecessary individual problems in communication, of course, verbal or written communication. And what is probably the, the most important, <clears throat> such people may try, may start avoiding some communication situations and activities because it would be easier for them and probably safer for them not to take part in some communication activities because then nobody will see their deficits and their problems. So avoiding is one of the things that may happen. So if we would like to define somehow special educational needs, we would say that special educational needs are educational requirements of pupils or students with any of a wide range of physical disabilities, medical conditions, intellectual difficulties, emotional uh, or behavioral problems. In Poland, for example, quite a lot of F, quite, quite a lot of efforts are done to diagnose the kids as early as possible. And as a consequence, um, Polish children are usually diagnosed in the very first stages of education. So that is usually kindergarten or primary school. And on the level of kindergarten or school, it is done, I mean, the diagnosis uh, is somehow done by the teachers or specialists who conduct the classes. And that is quite obvious. Well, teachers are the people who have the real contact with the kids, the small kid and they see the child in an educational context. They can compare the behavior of the child with uh, the behavior of other children. And it is quite easy for the teachers to see some anomalies and some problems. So it really is like that. I know that on the example of my kids that there are different programs of diagnosing the kids. And if it turns out that there is some child who needs some support, some, some help. Teachers inform parents and informs school specialists and the professional help starts. Of course, there are some disorders that are known much earlier. So uh, in case of, for example, Asperger's syndrome that we will be talking about today, diagnosis usually occurs when the child is three or four years old. So just before going to the kindergarten. And if the child is diagnosed so early, that influences the way that aware parents behave. I have the example of such kids among my friends and the, the child was diagnosed quite early. And as a result, her mom decided to give up the job and just concentrate on the needs of the kid. And the, the kid was sent to specialized kindergarten. Now she's in specialized school and it's brought quite nice results so that the girl changed her behavior and functions much better in the society now. And uh, fortunately, because there are so many diagnoses of Asperger syndrome in Poland of dyslexia, the kids became entitled to proper help at school and in special counseling centers. There are special counseling centers in Poland and they definitely try to help such kids, such students. And what is important, the, the kids and the parents of such kids are given the help by law. So they are just entitled to that. 
There is another side of the problem. A huge responsibility was put on teachers. As I said, the teachers are the first ones to notice the problem. And they are somehow obliged to give psychological and learning support to such students, which is another task which is put on teachers. Some of them are not that happy about the situation, but try to do their best to help. But generally, from my point of view, it is good that they are obliged to do it because they see the kid in a different surrounding and they can just notice more than parents. What are types of special, well, maybe not types, who belongs to the group of people with special educational needs? This group is quite big and mainly the group includes mentally handicapped children. But these are also disabled children, the, the ones, for example, moving on wheelchairs. And in case of such students, we are talking about some physical barriers mainly. mainly. There are also children and students with lower than average IQs, the visually impaired, the hearing impaired, the students with speech impediments and dyslexic ones. So these are the ones that we are today interested in, dyslexic ones. You may be surprised, but sometimes also gifted and talented students are included in the group of those with special educational needs. So the question is why? The answer is quite obvious. If the child, the student, school student is gifted and talented, they also need special attitude of a teacher. So the material should be prepared in a bit different way. The tempo, the speed of work is different. The type of activities which are given to such a student should be different as to help him or her, as to motivate the person and as to encourage the process of learning. So that's why they are also sometimes included to the group of those with special educational needs. Well, you may ask the question why it is important. Well, answers are quite obvious. Well, it is important to realize developmental disorders and special educational needs because we meet such people. They just surround us and they are also at the universities because the prob their problems don't disappear. The students, when they become adults, they just grow up. So some of the symptoms disappear, but occur another sympt other symptoms. And adults suffering from these developmental disorders, they just learned how to live with that. So somehow they know how to cope with their deficits. Of course, some of them do it in a better way. Some of them do it in a uh, worse way. But generally, we as people who surround those with developmental disorders, if we are aware of their problems, we can also help them. I am sure that if you think about that after the presentation, you will probably be able to say that you know or met a person suffering from dyslexia, from Asperger syndrome, maybe from ADHD. If the problems are so common, they must influence communication process that we, as those without dysfunctions, take part in, because we just meet these people. And if we don't realize the existence of the people and of their problems, we may unconsciously and unintentionally harm them and make their life just more difficult because we don't understand their problems. But if we do understand the problems, we may make the communication process better and more efficient. And that is the aim of our today's meeting. And as I said, we will, I will say a few words about the dyslexia, then we will skip to ADHD. And the last, and from my point of view, the most interesting and important thing is disorder is Asperger syndrome. So the last uh, topic that we will mention today. So let's start with dyslexia. I've, I'm sure you know dyslexic people, you met them, maybe your students are dyslexic. Uh, and on the slide, I just want to show you some examples that probably you are familiar with. So the problems in writing typical for dyslexic people. 
The examples are taken from the internet and they are in English, but I guess that every language has there has its own problems. But what is given, what is shown in, in on the slide are the written problems. So on the left hand side, we are given the sentences that uh, should be written, well, maybe not should be written, but are written by the person with uh, problems related to dyslexia. Probably the example on the right hand side is more vivid because if we are not given the text below, the text which is printed, I guess we would have so many problems to, to read what the person has written. And to be honest, I remember I got that type of writing once when I was at school. So one of my students in my English classes, he was writing in such a way. It was just not possible to read that. And I remember that if it was about written papers at the very beginning, when I didn't realize the problem, I just had to ask the person to read that to me because I couldn't. And then we changed the way of working and the person started preparing the written papers on the computer and then it made a huge difference. But the example on the right hand side is related to dyslexia, but also dysgraphia, which is somehow combined with dyslexia and I will tell about that a bit later. And let's have a look at the second group of examples also taken from the Internet and also related to the English language, but um, that is well, the things shown in there are typical for the Polish language tool. Uh, if you have a look at the pink example, the very first thing that is the, um, the problem with letters that seem to be similar. So English and Polish letter D and B, they are quite similar, uh, but th they just are written from another side. But as you can see, for dyslexic people, it's not that easy to, to, to see, to, to remember, to memorize the difference. So here, instead of day, it was written bay. So B instead of D. Well, the second example, drumstick, is the way, the word that should be written. You can see how it was written by the dyslexic person. Um, they use no spacing, they mix the letters. Probably the last example on the pink paper is quite interesting. So that is the phonetic mistake. So the person had B end instead of the end, and that's as the person wrote it down. On the yellow one, you are given similar uh, confusions. In the first case, it is the confusion between P and G letter, but also uh, Confusion between, between B and D once again is given and some sequencing difficulties. That is quite interesting. So instead of writing me, M, E, the person wrote another way around, E, M. So that is also quite common. And as I said, I guess you know that way of handwriting because students may deliver their papers prepared in such a way if they are dyslexic. And if we realize the problem, maybe we will be able to help them during our classes. So what is dyslexia? On the example of the above things, uh, the uh, above slides, we can say that dyslexia is a disorder involving specific difficulties in reading and writing. But the very important thing in here is that the difficulties in reading and writing they go with normal mental development. So there are no mental problems in case of such people. Dyslexia has a persistent character and cannot be explained by sensory deficits, cognitive difficulties, lack of motivation, lack of reading instructions. So these are not the problems and these are not the, the reasons of dyslexia. Why? Because dyslexia is of neurobiological origin. So it is once again related to neurological problems. And dyslexia is characterized by inadequate facilities in language processing. So some difficulties in language processing are the core of the problems. These language processing problems are manifested in decoding and encoding difficulties. And among the most common causes of dyslexic reading problems is 
poor work identification ability. And you could have seen that on the example of this um, problems with B and the D letter, P and G letter. So that, that's, that's more or less this. And correct phonological awareness is important in alphabetic languages because they are based on links between orthography and phonology. And that is the reason of the problems. And there are also some cognitive deficits seen in dyslexics, like deficits in the short term or working memory. So we as teachers should just remember that they will have problems with, um, with short term and working memory. Uh, they will have, that is my mistake on the slides, it should be in a uh, term of working memory. So they, they may be quite slow when processing information and they will have problems with automatization of their activities. There are a few theories on developmental dyslexia. I said that it is of neurobiological origin, but according to the theories, who try to broaden the problem. Um, developmental dyslexia is the result of phonological deficit uh, theory. It, it is related to double deficit theory, which means that there is a deficit in phonological skills or in rapid or automatized learning in some magnocellular or cerebellar deficit theory, but we will not, we will not deal with that. I would like to pay your attention, to draw your attention to the image of dyslexia, which is different from the point of view of inter and intra individuality. So dyslexia just varies inter intra individually. What does that mean? That means that dyslexia may be just different in every person affected. And that is the reason of problems. So the easiest solution would be to read some hints about dyslexic people and try to use them. But we should remember that because people are different, they may suffer from dyslexia in a bit different way. And that's why it is so important to be able to see some um, medi medical certificates, some psychological documents related to the particular person and see what is advised in case of this one uh, person. It is also influenced by sex, and uh, it is noticed that dyslexia is more typical for men. But when talking about intra-individual differences, they refer to the dynamics of dyslexia in the life of affected person. So definitely at the very beginning of school career of a person, so when the kid starts the education problems and starts um, reading and writing, the symptoms of dyslexia are a bit different than in case of teenagers or adult people. And that's the intra-individual differentiation. Because of such a big scope of problems, uh, people with dyslexia, they often experience multiple problems in learning a foreign language. At the root of this, there are often difficulties in mastering their mother tongue. So if the person is not good at the, their native language, their mother tongue, they will have more problems with learning a foreign language. And dyslexia may be manifested differently in different languages. And this is related to how dyslexia depends on the individual cognitive profile of the dyslexic student. It also depends on the age of the students of previous experience in learning a foreign language. If the experience was bad, then the problems probably will be more serious. If the experience was good, the person will be somehow positive towards learning a foreign language. But dyslexia, when talking about foreign language, is also related to the transparency of the language. If the language is not transparent enough, that causes problems. The example is English. In case of English, we pronounce words in a different way than we write them. And that is the problem. 
If the language is the same on the graphing and phonological language, then it is quite easy. But in case of languages uh, in which there is the difference between graphic and phonological level, then the problem may be more serious. And that is the example of English. What is more, although, for example, Polish and Russian languages are quite similar, because if you hear the persons, if you are a Polish person and you hear the Russian one speaking Russian, more or less you may guess what the person is saying. So from that point of view, it should be quite easy for Polish dyslexic people to learn Russian. But when it comes to writing, it turns out that Russian is quite problematic for Polish dyslexic people because of the difference in the alphabet. So we have just different alphabets. And that may be a serious problem for dyslexic students. And the most important conclusion is that dyslexic students are just everywhere. They are in every school and they are in every university. And when they graduate from the university, they are just in every company and they work everywhere. But their life is a bit more difficult. Uh, why they are so everywhere? Well, I remember when I was younger, there was no problem of dyslexia at all. So nobody here in Poland told about dyslexia. If a kid at school had some writing problems, there were special classes for them. And they just spent more time at school and learned, learned and learned how to write properly. Some of them succeeded, some of them not. That is true that for some years, it has been more and more often diagnosed. Some people say that for the group of students, it is easier to have a certificate that they are dyslexic, that they should be treated in a bit different way because it just makes their life easier. On the other hand, more is known about the dyslexia and probably that is why there are more diagnoses of dyslexia and probably that is why so many parents, if they notice problems with their kids, they try to do something with that. Well, just to finish the topic of dyslexia, I would all only like to, pay, to draw your attention to other developmental disorders that are related to dyslexia. So very often when we meet a dyslexic person, that dyslexic person will also suffer from some other combined with dyslexia problem, problems. And these problem, problems are as follows. Very often it is dysphasia. So a speech development disorder in children. So it is typical for smaller ch children on the level of learning how to properly speak. But sometimes it may last for longer and it may be noticed by classmates by other people and may be a problem influencing the motivation, the, the need to speak, to communicate with other people. Another related problem is called dyscalculia and that is um, a dysfunction related to problems with calculating, with mathematics. So very often dyslexics, dyslexic people, they have problems on maths. That is also dyspraxia, which is the lack of physical coordination. So dyslexic people very often just have problems with coordination of their movements. These, these may be the problems related to keeping track of time. So it, is, it may be quite complicated to somehow control when the 10 minutes passed or it, it, we ask the dyslexic person to come to us in one hour time and it might be quite problematic for the person to keep the track of time. These may be issues linked to special, spatial or directional orientation. So the person wants to say turn left and says turn right or another way around. To be honest, I also have problems with it. And I think the majority of people sometimes mixes left and right. But in case of dyslexic people, it is, um, it is quite problematic and it is quite serious. And of course they, can get lost in a big city because they have directional orientation problems. And motor hyperactivity or attention disorders. And that is the thing we will deal with in a few seconds. 
just remember, symptoms change with time, but they don't disappear. They stay with a person till the end of her or his life. Well, here is a short film, but I think we will not watch it now. I will uh, put the link to this film uh, on the chat box. And if somebody wants to watch it during the break time, they, they can do that. That is just the, the English short film about uh, adult people suffering from dyslexia, but because of the, the English, um, that is not so easy for, for some of the listeners. Let's uh, leave it for the break. Well, there is nothing new in the film, but just for those who are interested, um, it will be possible to watch that during the, the break time. It lasts 10 minutes, I think. Another problem which is related to dyslexia is attention deficit hyperactivity. In a short, shortened form, it is called ADHD. And it is also a neurodevelopmental disorder. And um, <clears throat> typical things, typical problems for ADHD are the problems, the impairments with sustained attention, with restless overactivity and impulse control. And when talking about ADHD, we should remember about three keywords, which are inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. Inattention in case of ADHD, ADHD people is just the um, are problems with uh, lack the person lacks persistence. The person has difficulty sustaining focus. So these are the problems related with focusing on one thing. The person is disorganized and these problems are not due to defiance or lack of comprehension. They are just somehow related to behavior problems of ADHD. Hyperactivity is something that means that the person seems to move about constantly. So the person needs to be constantly moving. It includes situations in which moving, movement is not appropriate. So the person cannot really control the body. And even if they should keep still or just stand still, they cannot do that. The person may fidget, may tap, may talk all the time. In adults, it may be extreme restlessness. It may be trying to talk all the time and being active all the time. And impulsivity means that a person makes hasty actions that occur in the moment without first thinking about them. So we just act and only then think about that. And uh, it may be a desire of immediate rewards if we did something or inability to delay gratification. So we are very uh, willing to get something. We just cannot and don't want to wait for something. An impulsive person may be socially intrusive and excessively interrupt others, may make important decisions without considering the long-term consequences. And these are the people who want to talk all the time, even if they shouldn't. And probably we know such examples um, during the meetings of different times. There are some people who want to be in the center of attention. ADHD, although it is diagnosed, well, it can be diagnosed, although it is um, in, uh, different classifications of neurobiological problems, ADHD is severely criticized. Of course, there are groups of scientists who believe that it really exists and they, they do different research and try to prove the existence of ADHD. But there is also quite a big group of other scientists who don't believe in this disorder. And those who criticize ADHD, they have three reasons for that. Well, the first reason is that um, the opponents, those who criticize ADHD, they say that ADHD is only a medical excuse for bad behavior of kids and for the inability of parents to do something with that behavior, to stop the behavior, to influence the behavior. So according to that point of view, ADHD is just an excuse for parents 
to say, okay, I just cannot do anything with the bad behavior of my kid. There is another group of scientists who say that ADHD should not be on the list of real problems because according to them, ADHD is related to a big medical business. Why? Because especially in the United States, if the person is diagnosed with ADHD, they are prescribed quite serious medicines and they are advised to take the medicines. So the medicines are given also to quite small kids. And that is, of course, a big medical business. So from the point of view of some of the scientists, it is just the way to earn money by big business factories and big business, sorry, big medical factories, big medical companies. And there is the third group of those who criticize ADHD and say that it just doesn't exist. These are doctors who just say that ADHD is a lie. There is nothing like that. Well, the example of such doctors is a child neurologist, Fred Brauman, and he quite often repeats that ADHD is a lie. Wherever the truth is, it is still on the list of developmental disorders. And that's why I will tell you only a few words about that, uh, because if it is on the list, we should realize it and should know how to behave when such a student occurs, appears on our class, in our classes, on our lessons. According to the research done by those who believe in ADHD, ADHD can coexist with dyslexia. So that is somehow related. And these hyperactivity problems are quite typical for dyslexic people. According to the research, the problem of ADHD is typical for 3 to 5% of school children. So it affects such a group of school children. And the same as in case of dyslexia, it cannot be cured, but symptoms can be softened and additional problems can be prevented. And in the group of additional problems, very often there are listed such as different types of fears, depression, addictions, and criminal activity. Because according to the scientific research, those who are diagnosed with ADHD are somehow more willing to get involved in criminal activity. And that these are the additional problems that can be prevented if the person is under a proper help of, of specialists. Because we are mostly interested today in adult people, I would like you to have a look at a short list of symptoms that may occur in ADHD adults. Mostly, a typical symptom in adults is carelessness and lack of attention to detail. So, uh, People suffering from ADHD, they just uh, cannot concentrate on something very detailed. Continually starting new tasks before finishing old ones. So the people just start many things, but, but they never end them. They never finish them. Poor organizational skills. That might be a real problem. If there are many things to do, ADHD person does have serious problems with organizing the work, with just controlling the things to be done. Inability to focus or prioritize. Continually losing or misplacing things. They just don't know where they left something. They don't know if they did something. They don't know what they do with the thing. Forgetfulness. And I guess that might be quite problematic in everyday life restlessness and edginess, constant movement. So that is the problem of ADHD people. They need to, to move all the time. Difficulty keeping quiet and speaking out of turn. And if such a person occurs in a group on a meeting, that might be quite problematic because the person cannot just keep quiet and stay still, needs to, to speak from time to time and just ask questions out of turn. And that might be quite complicated blurting out responses and often interrupting others. 
So they just don't keep to any rules. They want to respond. They want to interrupt the person if they feel they need to say something. Mood swings or so mood changes, irritability, and a quick temper. So let's do the first and only then think about it. Inability to deal with stress, extreme impatience, and taking risks in activities. For example, speed driving and just risky activities, risky sports. That is something that ADHD people, adult people, maybe not only adult teenagers too, would be interested in. So more or less, these are the problems we can deal with when we meet a person suffering from ADHD. And later I will tell you what we can try to do to somehow control uh, the behavior of such a person and to, to help the person. The last, before the break, the last um, disorder, as I said, the most interesting from my point of view is called Asperger syndrome, and it is a type of autism. Um, it is interesting from my point of view because on my teaching way at school, I meet more and more often students, school students, who are diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. And it became such a serious problem that there was the moment that, that, that the headmaster of my school, my uh, secondary school, decided to have a special training for teachers because we just didn't know how to behave, how to react to some behaviors of such students. And maybe the most problematic thing was that we didn't understand why the person behaves in such a particular way. I present the picture which probably shows some part of the problem. So if we have an Asperger syndrome kid, the kid at the very first sight will not differ anyhow from other kids. So the, the kid looks the same if he or she doesn't say anything, doesn't move, they, they, they make an impression that they are the same. And let's imagine the situation that early in the morning, the kid is getting ready to school, but is not very willing to go to school. So that tells the kid, stay in school. The kid goes to school, stays in school, has the lessons. Everybody goes home because it's time to close the school, but the kid is still on the place, just is sitting in the classroom. So the parents get nervous, where is our, our kid? And finally, they go to school to check if the kid is still there. And as you can see in the picture, they see their son sitting in the classroom, empty classroom, no teacher, no other kids. And they say, son, it's almost midnight, come home. And the kids answer, first you said stay in school make up your mind. Why? Because Asperger syndrome kids and adults, they understood literally what was said. If they got the information, stay in school, stay there, be there, they did it. They didn't understand that it was meant for them to stay in school while the lessons are there and then go back home. They understood it literally and they just did what they were set to do. And that is one of many problems related to Asperger's syndrome. I just wanted to, to show you the picture because from my point of view, it is quite symptomatic and just gives some hint of the problems that they suffer with. But let's have a look at some details and some basic information related to the syndrome. Asperger's syndrome... That's Hmm? Asperger's syndrome is the name that, uh, to be honest, shouldn't occur anymore because in 2013, this particular um, disorder became a part of one big umbrella diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And that means that since 2013, Asperger's syndrome has been just a part of autism. And that's why it is sometimes called as high-functioning autism spectrum disorder. And the name, the 
existence of the name да, да, became a bit problem because quite a lot of people got used to the name Asperger syndrome and they didn't want to change it. They just felt good with the name Asperger. What is more, for this the parents of kids with Asperger syndrome, the name Asperger syndrome was a kind of hope because it just sounds different if they say that my child is Asperger. Then my Доброго дня, дівчата. So it так, is the ma- добрий день. Нас ще малувато, так? Хотілося, щоб були усі. Можна попросити виключити? І тоді розпочнемо. Так, мені... Я відразу хочу сказати, що е, не буде е, жодних е, проблем із заліком. Окей. Okay. Um... So coming back to coming back to to high functioning uh, spect- autism spectrum disorder. So that's as it is called now. However, as I said, those who suffer from Asperger syndrome they, they still prefer being called Aspergers, and that is why I will use that name uh, in my presentation. Um, there is a serious difference between autism people, autistic people, and Asperger syndrome people. And the difference is related to verbal language skills and intellectual uh, ability. If there are verbal language skills and proper intellectual ability in people, they are called Asperger's. But those who, who lack verbal language skills and intellectual ability, they are, they are called autistic people. And that is why those who have language, verbal language skills and their intellectual ability is proper, they are, they are called high-functioning autism spectrum disorder sufferers. Because although they are somehow autistic, their skills are good enough and that allows them to, to communicate with the, the society. And the, the, the most serious problems when talking about Asperger's are related to their social deficiency, to their limited interests, obligatory behavior with no verbal communication problem. So that is the most important. We can communicate with these people in a normal way, but they will have some social uh, problems related to, to some limitations in their behavioral skills. And once again, as in case of ADHD and dyslexia, Asperger syndrome can be prevented or treated, but with time, Asperger's just learn how to compensate their deficits and the deficits don't disappear. And that's what we as teachers have to deal with later. Let's have a look at these symptoms. So first of all, the symptoms of Asperger syndrome start early in life. I mentioned the example of the daughter of my friend who was three years old when she was diagnosed. And she was diagnosed only because her mom had some experience with babysitting many years before. So she knew more or less how the development of a kid should be. And when she had her own daughter, she realized that there are some differences. So she couldn't say that her daughter behaved in the same way as the kids she had known uh, from the time that she was babysitting. Uh, What the, the symptoms in kids are. So very often a kid can't make eye contact. So they just look, don't look into the eyes. They don't make eye contact. They uh, seem, well, it seems awkward uh, for them to be in social situations. They don't know what to say. They don't know how to respond when someone talks to them. Usually kids know it, but those with Asperger syndrome feel strange and don't know how to behave. And that's why they even start avoiding that type of situations. Uh, They may miss social cues that are obvious to other children, like body language or the expressions on people's faces. If they see the person who crosses their arms and scolds like that, 
they do not understand that that means the person is angry. They just cannot read the body language. They don't understand that. They may show few emotions. So it is quite hard to realize what the person, Asperger syndrome kid, Asperger syndrome person feels because they usually do not show emotions. They may not smile when they are happy or laugh at a joke. That is quite surprising. Um, other kids, they smile, they laugh when there is something funny, when they are happy, but Asperger's may not. They may speak in a flat, robotic kind of way. So there is no proper intonation. They, the way of speaking is quite, quite uninteresting for those who listen to that. So with no emotion, a flat, robotic kind of way. They may talk about themselves most of the time and with a lot of intensity on a single subject, like some football star or some other things they are interested in. Well, here comes to my mind the example of another friend of mine. He is 14 years old and he's an Asperger. And uh, his problem is the fixation on Angry Birds story. And every time we meet, he wants to talk only about Angry Birds. Even if we try to stop him, he finds the way to go back to us with the topic. And it is really, really difficult to make him stop talking on that particular topic. That is the fixation. So if Asperger's are interested in something, they want to talk about that all the time. Another example of that related to my teaching practice was one of our school students who was very fluent in English. And during English classes, he was very active and he wanted to, to talk a lot. And once my, my colleague, another teacher, um, she wanted to talk about London and about some interesting places in London. And it turned out that this boy, nobody knew that he was Asperger then, that this boy was uh, very willing to, to talk about London. He had a lot to say, but the problem was that at the very beginning, the teacher was happy because there was the person very active, but then she wanted to give a chance to other students to join the, the speech. And it was not possible. She just couldn't make him stop talking. He wanted to add many things and it turned out it was totally out of control of a teacher. Only later, we got the information that this is the Asperger syndrome kid. That was a new school student. That's why nobody knew that. And that also um, makes me think about the, the problem I try to understand, but I can't really. There are, in my, in my school, there are sometimes parents who inform all the teachers about the problem. They even sometimes give a special kind of manual instruction, how to behave in case of some Asperger syndrome activities of their son or daughter. So they just give some hints to teachers how to react in some situations. But on the other side, on the other hand, they don't want the teachers to inform other classmates of their son or daughter that the person has Asperger syndrome problems. So the situation is the teachers know it, other school students don't, and the, the person behaves sometimes in a very strange way. The teachers understand why, because they were told the truth and they know how to react. But for classmates, the situation is weird, is strange, they see the person as the one they don't really want to deal with because the behavior is unpredictable, the behavior of the person is not understood. And what I don't understand in here is why the parents are so unwilling to make this information public. Well, I guess it may be because teenagers can be cruel and can use it as a kind of weapon against the person, but on the other hand, if the classroom, the classmates, was somehow informed about the problems, if there was somebody who told them how such a person behaves and why, maybe that would influence the, the, the existence of the person in the class. 
coming back to the symptoms, um, early symptoms. So the, the sufferers of Asperger's syndrome might repeat themselves a lot, especially on a topic they are interested in. So that's what I have already said that they might also do the same movements over and over. They dislike change, and that is true. For instance, they may eat the same food for breakfast every day because they don't want to change it. They like uh, the repetitive situations or may have trouble moving from one class to another during the school day. So for us, it is so obvious, okay, let's change the room for today's lessons because another teacher needs the TV set and let's change the room. For us, it is so easy to take our things and just go to another room. For the Asperger syndrome sufferer, it is not that easy. So it somehow it ruins the whole plan of the day and the time needed to accept the new situation. So the change is quite long. It just doesn't happen in seconds. And it may destroy the whole day of such a person. When talking about general symptoms of Asperger, especially when talking about adult people, they can be classified as it is showed, shown on the slide. So these are the difficulty, difficulties with social communication and interaction, hypersensitivity to sensory assaults, and that is something we can somehow control. So let's imagine the situation. We have our classes in a big uh, university room, just big class, and there is some problem with the lights. The lights switch off and on uncontrollably and from time to time they make some strange noise. That is something that for an Asperger may be very, very problematic because the person is hypersensitive. hypersensitive. If there is some radio on or TV on, we as people not suffering from that may not even notice that, but for Asperger, it can be a really serious problem. Another group of problems is extreme focus on specific topic of interest. That's what I said. Difficulty with changes in routines. We also said that challenges with empathy. They just don't understand the behavior of other people. So it's not wise to tell an Asperger syndrome person just feel what he feels because the person will not understand that and engaging in stereotype repetitive behaviors. But Asperger syndrome sufferers, they have their strengths. For example, they are very, they have very remarkable focus and persistence. So if they are asked to complete the task, they will do that. They will focus on it. They will see all the details of that and they will be very persistent while completing, completing it. Another strength is aptitude for recognizing patterns and attention to detail, as I said. For example, ADHD sufferers are the opposite. They will not concentrate, they will not focus, they will be not persistent, Asperger's will be. But there are also some challenges they have to deal with. And uh, probably the most important, the most uh, difficult is hypersensitivity. That's what I said, um, hypersensitivity is to light, to sounds, to tastes. It is difficult because the, the lights, the sounds, tastes, etc., they are just everywhere. As I said, we do not pay attention to that. But Asperger's are very, um, they just hear, see, feel everything. Difficulty with the give and take of conversation, so difficulty with reaching the compromise during some conversation. So if it is the, the meeting uh, at work, it can be problematic if the, the person cannot uh, accept something, cannot change his or her point of view on some matter. So compromise is something very complicated. Difficulty with nonverbal communication skills. So they don't really know how to keep the distance, how loud they should say, the tone they should choose. They have difficulties with that. If we don't know it, it may be an example of bad behavior of the person in our eyes. Uncoordinated movements, clumsiness, anxiety and depression. And here comes to my mind the example of a student um, who was my, I was a supervisor of her, of her um, bachelor thesis. So she was coming to me, she was meeting me from time to time 
in my uh, room and we had some talks about her paper. And I remember that uh, when she was with me in my room, uh, she, when, I was, when, when she was talking, she was looking at me and everything looked normal. But when I was answering her questions and I was talking to her, she turned her uh, head left or right. So she didn't look at me at all. She was looking somewhere left or somewhere right. I could see not her face, but her ear. And if I didn't know the reasons of that, I would think that the person is just rude because eye contact in our culture is something obvious and something important. But because I had similar problems at school with other students, I knew that she might be an Asperger. And in such a situation, it meant that Asperger syndrome sufferers, they cannot use two channels to perceive information. So when she, when she was talking to me, she was looking at me, probably not seeing me at all, but just uh, directing her eyes uh, on my face. So it looked normal. But when I was um, talking to her, she wanted to listen carefully to me. And that's why she turned her face, her head, because in such a way she turned off the visual channel. So she had her eyes open, but she didn't concentrate on anything. And that's why she could listen carefully to me. As I said, if I hadn't known that, the impression would be that she's bad behaved, so she, she behaves bad and she's rude, but she was an Asperger and she, want, she wanted, she tried to do her best to understand as much as possible of what I was saying. Uh, here is another film related to this, uh, to Asperger syndrome, but um, as in case of dyslexia, I think we will not watch it. I will just uh, put the link on a chat box so those who are willing, they will be able to watch it later or during the break time. And just the last slide before the break. Uh, so let's have a look how we can help Asperger's on the level of some therapies and treatments, not on the level of our own behavior, but on the level of more organized help. So there are different types of treatments or therapies. Probably the most popular one, ones, they are related to the following. So first of all, it is cognitive behavioral therapy, which is of course uh, done by specialists and can help address anxiety and other personal challenges. Another one are different types of social skills trainings that can help with conversational skills and understanding social cues. These are also speech language therapies that can help with voice control. So they help to, to control the way the, the person speaks, the, the pronunciation the person used, the, vo the, the control of voice in many aspects of that. They also um, get lessons on how to keep up a two-way conversation and understand social cues like hand gestures and eye contact. So the, the things they are missing, the things they have problems with. These are different types of physical and occupational therapies that can improve their coordination, the, the movement coordination, body coordination, but also parent education trainings. Um, that is a very important thing. Uh, if in a family there is a child suffering from Asperger syndrome, it is not easy at all for parents to deal with it, to help the kid. And that's why special parent trainings are necessary. I remember when my friend uh, decided that her daughter will go to specialized kindergarten. It wasn't like just mm -hmm. signing up a special list and, and informing the headmaster that there is a kid who would like to, to, to join the group of Asperger's in, in the specialized kindergarten. She had, she as a parent, as a mother, she had to sign a special contract in which it was said that she will uh, try, she will work with the kid at home. She will continue the things which are started in the kindergarten in the first half of the day. She will try to do the same things at home, but to 
to be able to do that, she had to have some special training to understand why it is so important and to be taught how to work with her kid at home. In case of my friend, that was a very good decision. She signed the document and as I said, she gave up her professional activity just to spend as much time as possible with her daughter. And the final result now is that the, the kid is in the primary school, I think third or even fourth grade. That is the normal school with some integrational classes and she deals quite well with other school um, schoolmates, classmates. So big thing was done. Of course, she needs support all the time, but the difference is, is really impressive. And the last aspect, these are dif different types of psychoactive medicines that can help manage, associate anxiety, depression, and ADHD, so the thing that I mentioned. Uh, medicines are given in more serious cases when we deal with anxiety, with depression, so definitely with problems that should be somehow under control and should be prevented if it is possible to, to prevent them. So these are organizational ways of, of helping Asperger's syndrome sufferers. I think now it is a good moment to have a break. And after the break, I will tell you what we as teachers, what we as those who have some kind of relations with such people, what we can do to help each group of developmental disorder sufferers to, to, to make our lessons better to make our functioning with them better. So I think I will now switch off. Okay, so here we are. Так, то есть хороший момент половина. Да, да, да. Может быть, по первой части есть вопросы у участников? Если есть вопросы, или можем потом в конце уже после второй части быть общие вопросы? Может, в конце там. У нас будет несколько минут в конце. Да. Тогда мы не выходим. Сколько мы даем на перерыв? 15 минут, 20, как вы хотите. Мне там все равно, но просто, может быть, отдыха немножко надо. То есть обязательно, обязательно. 10-40, может быть, встречаемся да. завтра. Да, ну по украинскому 11.40, да. Ну, понятно, да, это да, да, да. время. Вот, и тогда уже э, после перерыва вы скинете ссылочку, или презента... а, презентацию мы же разошлем, в принципе, могут посмотреть и фильмы. Да, вот фильмы я на чате поставлю эти ссылки на это. Да. Есть, вот сейчас это сделаю, ну, то есть... Это mm -hmm. первое, и сейчас поставлю вторую. Только найду ее. О, все. Mm -hmm. Еще второй ссылки не было. Но я поставила две. Посмотрите, пожалуйста, мне кажется, что там все А, быть. есть две. Все, все, да, просто там пробила. Нет, все, да, две ссылочки есть. Тогда в 11.40, в 10.40 по польскому времени, да, мы встречаемся. Да. Все, договорились. Угу.